do an adjustment. All right. Well, thank you. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jim, Jim, Jim Zimmelman. Um, Glasses. Dr. Zimmelman is a <laughs> senior planetary geologist with the Smithsonian Center for Planetary Studies at the National Air and Space Museum. A position he's held since a position he's held since uh, 1988. Um, he has over a hundred peer-reviewed manuscripts and 450 published abstracts, including uh, a book he co-authored called Dune Worlds. His particular speciality is windblown sands on Mars, and today he's going to present Mars, exploration, past, present, and future. Please welcome Dr. Zimbelman. Well, thank you all. It looks like an amazing activity. This is my first time to be associated with you guys, thanks to, is it Lyle or John, or what do you go by? Lyle, okay. And what, after some email exchanges with him, what I've decided to do is give you sort of those three flavors of Mars. Now this will probably be old hat, at least the first half, for, for those of you who are familiar with it, but it's to give you the historical context for what we know about Mars, current studies, and it'll emphasize some of the things we do down at the Air and Space Museum, which you may not be aware how much Mars research is going on there and then some discussions about the future and one of my favorite Mars movies, but I wanna tell you a little bit about the pluses and minuses of that. So we'll start with the past exploration of Mars. And uh, you guys who bother to come out to an event like this are familiar with telescopes and looking at uh, celestial objects. Mars has been of interest since before the telescope. We're gonna start at the telescopic era with someone named Schiaparelli, an Italian astronomer who has sort of gotten into the Mars literature because he made maps, but he also described them with the Italian word named canali. And unfortunately in the translation, people just dropped that eye off of it and it took on the connotation of a constructed feature. That was not his intent. Um, he thought these were naturally formed linear features that he didn't understand. Well, this dominated our thought about Mars for decades and dominated also the 1950s B-movies, lo loads of them. Um, this map from 1962, there we go, is one of the last ones before the spacecraft era, and that's what I'm gonna concentrate on. Made at Lowell Observatory. Now, those of you who are familiar with the background know that Percival Lowell built his own observatory in Flagstaff specifically to study Mars and other things, looking for these linear features. He was very influenced by the Schiaparelli uh, maps. So the Lowell Observatory up to 1962 was still including these linear features. Afterwards, if you wanna talk about what those really are, we can discuss that. I'm not gonna dwell on that right now, but in 1965, things changed dramatically um, this is only 50 some years ago that the sort of the current view of Mars began to evolve. Only 22 pictures were returned by Mariner 4 as it flew by the planet. Those little squares are the images it took. This is the uh, 11th frame. And although it's fuzzy, you can see craters. That was a huge surprise at this time. So this was the beginning of the end of John Carter and the idea that Mars was full of all of these amazing life forms that science fiction authors talked about. This looked a lot like the moon. And this in fact dominated our view of what Mars was like through the late 60s. Mariner 6 and 7 also flew by <coughs> different parts, but they all happened to photograph the ancient crater terrain on the planet. And so up through 69, this was our perspective. It was a old dead planet, looked a lot like the moon. Well, that changed radically in 1971. And I remember this because I was in high school and subscribed to Sky and Telescope. I'm sure some of you guys do as well. And I remember the Mariner images sort of coming out month to month, learning more about what Mars really was like. So here's the continental US overlaying on a modern shaded relief version but Mariner 9 showed us this massive canyon system, Valles Marineris, Canyon of the Mariners. 
named for these early explorers, the volcanoes. All of this stuff was missed by those early flybys. It took an orbiter to begin to reveal what Mars really was like. The Viking landings in 1976, um, two of them, this was back at the time when NASA flew uh, or rather built things in pairs. In case one failed, they could have a backup. Unfortunately, we no longer do that. Uh, but in the Viking case, both of them worked. So we had two landers, two orbiters. This is our uh, full-size engineering version of the Viking landers. It's in Milestones of Flight down on the mall. Um, the pictures taken by it, these didn't move, but they operated uh, for several years and showed the surfaces change through the season. So, for example, this is that whitish stuff is frost. So we, for the first time, saw the advance and retreat of the seasonal caps from the ground and realized that it was just a very thin coating of frost that was being seen telescopically as this advancing sheet of ice. Now, why is the surface tilted? Well, the Vikings were designed to avoid rocks up to 22 centimeters high. That's not that big. This curved surface is, it, surface is very fortunate because the Viking II lander, one of its three foot pads got hung up on a big rock, and that's what gave it this tilted surface. Well, that is a very good thing because on the robotic arm was a small mirror that they could see beneath the spacecraft, and there was one of these 25 centimeter tall pointed rocks right beneath the computer heart of the spacecraft. Had that foot pad not gotten hung up on the one rock, engineers are sure it would have punctured the bottom of the spacecraft and killed the lander. So um, all of a sudden we don't mind rocks as long as our engineering can deal with it. Well, the Viking lander sort of dominated news for a long time. The Viking orbiters operated in up to 1982, gave us 55,000 images. That's in fact what I used through my graduate studies, was mostly based on Viking information. This is modern computer processing of that old data, can give us great views of Mars. And Viking didn't show us as many new things as Mariner 9 did, but it showed them in much greater detail. We got much better geologic understanding of the planet from the Viking uh, information. Well, hopefully all you guys remember Mars Pathfinder. This was a new type of lander. So here is the small rover, still stowed in this case, but these are the airbags. Pathfinder, the name really told you what the spacecraft did. This was landing on another planet in a very different way. And I heard one engineer describe it. Imagine you had your laptop and you got on top of a five-story building and you were going to wrap it in garbage bags and throw it off and assume it would work. That's what we're challenged to do. Well, it did work. These are airbags basically built out of bulletproof vest kinds of materials to uh, deal with the rocks. Pathfinder was looking for rocks because the little rover went and gave us our first chemical measurements on site on rocks that the scientists targeted from the uh, lander. A separate orbiter, and I can't go through all of these. Hopefully you'll realize that this is a very US-centric vision I'm giving you. Other things were going on, but the short version is the Russians have had a terrible time with Mars. They've had good luck with Venus, awful luck with Mars. Well, one of our orbiters had a laser altimeter that would fire a little laser pulse, very accurately measure the distance from the spacecraft down to the surface, and that could be translated to the absolute elevation for the first time of the surface to about a few feet, a couple of less than a meter. Before this, it's maybe hard to believe now, but before this, we really didn't know what was up and down. We had general ideas from Viking, but uh, the this laser altimeter really changed our geologic perspective to know how water flowed. For example, we knew the geological gradient gradient that the water had to use, how deep the Hellas Basin was, and uh, information like that. And this is still the base for even our current information uh, is this global MOLA uh, topography. Uh, if you didn't hear him, what is zero? And that's a very good question because there's no sea level on Mars. In the Viking days, it was arbitrarily set as a particular uh, 
elevation at which carbon dioxide and water vapor did some certain things. And it turns out to be the 6.1 millibar level in the atmosphere. That became zero. Now MOLA refined that and their zero was dependent on sort of a global average close enough to this Viking one. It is arbitrary. It's just in this representation, this is the lowest spot on Mars and the tops of the volcanoes are the highest. And the relief on a planet half the size of the Earth is twice as much as the relief on the Earth. So a little Mars does things in a big way. And that's illustrated by one volcano, Olympus Mons, I shouldn't say discovered, but first really understood by Mariner 9 because in fact, telescopic observers like you guys saw this. It's just they saw the clouds around it and didn't really know what it was. Well, this is the biggest mountain, the biggest volcano in the solar system. 100 kilometers is like 60 miles. This is as big as the state of Arizona, one volcano. So our volcanoes on Earth don't really approach this scale. Why? The simple answer is on Earth, things are moving around on our crustal plates. Mars seems to be a one plate planet. If the volcano is pumping away, it just keeps pumping in that same spot and builds very large constructs like this. Lower gravity, but it's, uh, the gravity doesn't really affect how high things build up. Um, it has a strong effect on the wind that we'll get to uh, in a little bit. Uh, again, something that hopefully you guys still remember, 2004 when the twin spacecraft uh, Spirit and Opportunity landed. Now here we went back to this idea of two, and I can't go into all of the details of it, but uh, one of the NASA administrators named Dan Golden, Steve Squires, the scientist who proposed this uh, spacecraft, was talking to Golden. We had just had some setbacks. Both the U.S. and the uh, Russians had had a couple of failures at Mars in the late 90s. And Golden said to Squires, what could you do with two of them? And this is something that Steve hadn't thought of. Well, Dan found the money in NASA to build a second one based on the designs that Squires had uh, proposed and had been approved by NASA and that allowed us to have two rovers on opposite sides of the planet so unfortunately the poor scientists never got sleep when one rover was shutting down for the night the next one was waking up and uh, that but that was a good problem as you can imagine for the science team this is sort of human scale the cameras at the top here are just a little bit shorter than I would be they are separated wider than our eye spacing, but intentionally give us stereo views from the surface as the rovers were moving around. It also had an arm about the length of a typical human arm, and uh, I've seen Squires in many of his presentations talking about that. They designed it to be a robotic geologist on Mars. That was his goal. So Spirit covered quite a bit of territory. I should back up one step. Squires, when his mission was approved, NASA said to achieve success, what NASA defined as success, your spacecraft will operate for 90 days and drive for 600 meters. Well, Spirit operated six years and drove a total of about seven kilometers, almost five miles. I think it definitely met its uh, goal. Well, it landed way up here, and in that sort of 90-day period was able to get to this one impact crater and realized that didn't show them the rocks that they were expecting to see. They had to drive down to these hills, and that's where the Spirit spent the rest of its time exploring this outcrop of older rocks, poking up through the lava flows that cover the floor of the crater where uh, Spirit landed. And we uh, lost communication with it in 2010, Unfortunately, uh, it got stuck in some soft soil and could not extract itself soon enough to get positioned to survive through the winter. Again, these spacecraft were not designed to last through the Martian winter, so the only way that they made them operational this long is they'd park them on a slope that tilted the solar panels towards the sun and uh, in increased the electric input to the batteries to keep them alive. Opportunity Squires would say was the fair-haired child of the two. Everything seemed to go right for this rover. It landed inside a, a small impact crater and Squires call, called it the 300 million mile golf shot. It's as if you putted opportunity and it landed exactly where the geologist would have wanted it to land. 
and found things we'll talk about in just a second right away that answered its science questions with it then proceeded to drive to the biggest crater up to this time that uh, had been explored by a rover 22 uh, kilometers about 16 miles in diameter and this is where we l recently lost communication with it scientists are still working on seeing if we can pick it up again and we'll talk more about this later it's consequence of the greatest dust storm in decades. Uh, you guys who have been looking at Mars probably realize that from mid-June uh, for several weeks, it was not much to look at, just this orange ball because dust had spread everywhere. It's unclear at this point if we're gonna hear from Opportunity again, but even if we don't, it has far exceeded its uh, design goals. So this is an example of the science that came from Opportunity, and here's part of the spacecraft after it had landed, it was still stowed. It looked over at a rock outcrop only a couple of tens of feet away from the lander that had the these little round things turned out to have the chemical composition that sent this spacecraft to this part of Mars. This is something called hematite that is a mineral that, at least as we understand it here on Earth, forms in the presence of water. Both rovers were intended to look for evidence of water in the Martian past in a geologic sense, and Opportunity found it within a couple of weeks. Spirit had to work a couple of years to find it. Uh, uh, again, Squires called it the working class rover, and uh, Opportunity was the, the fair-haired child of the group. Well, a lot of people forget that rovers aren't the only way to do Mars, and in 2008, the Phoenix lander was la uh, landed at the farthest north latitudes that we've ever visited with a uh, landed spacecraft. This is sort of what it looked like. Had a long arm to scoop into the soil and its mission was to look for ground ice. Well, it did find it, but it turned out that during the landing, this sort of gray patch is where the landing rockets blew away some of the overlying uh, dust and soil. And that's the uh, ground ice exposed by the landing rocket. We just didn't know it at the time that it's only about two centimeters, about one inch beneath the uh, soil at the latitude at which Phoenix landed. So conclusive evidence that this is good old water just like you're used to here on the Earth. Curiosity, the rover that's still active right now. Um, this is me next to our full-size model that we got from NASA after they had toured it around uh, the country and it's still in our Exploring the Planets gallery. This is big. In fact, the cameras are now higher than me. Um, same thing that there are stereo ones so we can get stereo views uh, of the surface. A much more capable robotic arm, but this one landed in a very different way, something that the engineers called the sky crane. So, uh, Sojourner on Pathfinder, Spirit and Opportunity were protected by these airbags and the thing sort of bounced around before it settled. This was too big for that technology to work. So here are retro rockets firing. The rover was lowered on cables down to the surface and then released and this thing flew off uh, and crash landed. And I remember hearing when this was described, I said, you've got to be kidding me. Um, and it worked. That's just evidence of when you put our engineers, give them a challenge, and they test things and test and test and retest enough, we can get remarkable results. Well, Curiosity is nuclear powered in the sense that heat from decaying plutonium is converted into electricity, drives this rover. As long as nothing breaks, this thing can operate for decades. Whereas Spirit and Opportunity were solar powered, and that's why um, potentially both of them are no longer going to be operational because they got stuck where they couldn't orient their solar panels just right. So here is Curiosity on Mars and when this was happening 2012 selfies were just sort of coming into their own and this is the first Mars selfie. So what happened? Here is that robotic arm and on the end of the actuator part there are like eight different instruments that you can sort of rotate around to what you want to do. One of them is a camera and in this view, it took 50-some images that were computer processed to take out the arm so that you're taking a selfie with removing the arm from the selfie mosaic. And this is what the spacecraft looks like on Mars. Here is where it had scooped into some of the soil. 
and the hill in the background, it's now climbing up the lower slopes of this giant mound in the center of Gator, Gale Crater. Another real advantage of Curiosity is that it had a drill. Now the Spirit and Opportunity could brush away the dust from the surface of the rock. Uh, Curiosity can actually drill into it, not real deep, a couple of inches, and sort of two, two different depths that they can use, but it gives them fresh material that is then analyzed in the instruments inside the spacecraft. This is the drill bit, very greatly enlarged. But I like to tell people, I, I talked to one of the engineers at, at JPL about this, who happened to be a friend who was testing this, and I said, where'd you get your drill bits? Assuming that bottom in Europe and tested 30,000 or something. He said, Home Depot. <laughs> and, and I said, you're kidding, right? And he said, no, it worked. And what they weren't expecting was that in testing the chemical uh, devices for the rover, they begin to get some strange compounds. And so Bob called up Home Depot and said, I work at JPL, we're using one of your drill bits on Mars. And the guy said, yeah, right, and hung up. <laughs> so Bob called back and he said, no, I'm serious. And he said, we need to know how you built your drill bits. And he said, that's a, a trade secret. You, you can't know that. And he said, I'll call you back in two hours. Bob got the chemical composition of what was bothering them and read off the components to this guy. And he said, how did you get that? And he said, we measured this in the laboratory with our sensitive instruments. Well, it turns out these are dipped in things to protect the drill bit. And the ones they flew were dipped in the same stuff. Well, we just needed to know what that was. And it took this sort of long process for Bob to finally be able to get Home Depot to tell the JPL scientists uh, exactly what they had used. I think it's great that a Home Depot drill is working up on Mars. So this is the mountain. It had the informal name Mount Sharp, um, af named after a very prominent geologist who has been involved in all of the Mariner missions. Its actual name is Aeolus Mons because USGS has some very specific guidelines as to what features can be named on other planets. Um, so in the literature, you'll actually find both of those. Well, Curiosity is slowly working its way up this hill. And over the next years, hopefully decades, it will be climbing higher and higher. Um, in a sense, to a geologist, this is looking from the oldest rocks to the youngest ones. And I hope it survives and doesn't get stuck or something break because it'll be like stripping off pages of the geologic textbook of Mars for this part and every new stop will give us new pages. What is the distance? Vertical distance, five kilometers, three miles. So three times as tall as the Grand Canyon is deep. It's never gonna get all the way to the top, but there are all kinds of wonderful geologic things to discover on the way up, as however far it gets. <laughs> we have not, but you might like to know that the rover tweets. It has regular tweets that the, you, there's a Twitter account for Curiosity if you want to follow tweets coming from Mars, obviously via the JPL engineers. So you can actually see stratification. Yeah. Do we know? We do not have the answer yet. Both of those alternatives are still viable, and I hope that these upper ones are volcanic for reasons we can get into later if you want. But you're absolutely right. Stratigraphy simply means the stacking of the rocks. That's what geologists look at. And Aeolus Mons just has this wonderful stacked sequence of rocks to look at. Well, Curiosity is still way down here in the older rough, older rocks. That's because that's what its main mission was, to look for chemical evidence, again, of water in the ancient, most ancient rocks that it could uh, investigate. So now we'll leave rovers briefly and look at orbiters. This is the latest camera to fly to Mars. And uh, Lyle gave this wonderful talk about video astronomy just before I got up here. This is the best camera we've flown at Mars yet. You're used to cameras taking 12, 20 megapixel images. High rise typically sends back 800 megapixel images of Mars, about 10 a day. So we're up to over 56,000 high rise images. It has revolutionized our understanding of the geology of Mars.
this is one edge of a canyon wall and you can see individual boulders you can see where some of them have slid down gullying per perhaps through water and things like that so the geology coming out of high rise is just phenomenal um, for each I'll just have three examples here each is about 500 meters so about 500 yards uh, across and this is just a small subsample of an individual image and if you want e any of these frames are available all of the raw data from the high-rise website all 56 plus thousand are out there now the camera looks at a variety of different things including surveying places repeatedly and in this case this crater didn't exist in 2012 in a high-rise picture taken here and uh, I believe this one was taken in 2014 something hit made that little blue crater there and this is the ejected material that came out from it so where you're observing impacts actually happening on Mars right now this camera is good enough to be able to let us measure things like that I study sand dunes I love this picture so this is near the North Pole uh, of the planet these curving crescent things are they're called Barkan sand dunes are sort of crescentic in shape which means the wind was blowing in this direction well they have this funny pink color because everything on Mars gets coated by dust including the sand dunes and it's mixed in the whites or frost that in the winter this is completely in the dark and that frost settles down gets fairly thick well within in the spring when the Sun comes up as it defrosts the sand sort of explodes out from beneath this frost cover and all of these little black spotches are the defrosting of the sand dunes as they are heating up as spring progresses just a teaser for the wonderful things that high rise which is still operational it continues to tell us about Mars this is almost an artsy picture so these are sand dunes again but what's going on here well all of these tracks are dust devil tracks if any of you have been in the southwest on a summer afternoon and you see these little whirlwinds moving along well these happen on Mars certain seasons more often than others and they scour the dust off of the surface well it doesn't mean that the sand dunes attract more of these dust devils than the other parts it's just that this is less dusty so it shows the track record more clearly than that more heavily dusted uh, terrain uh, around it so in certain parts of the planet at certain seasons this happens a lot this is the reason spirit and opportunity worked as long as they did the engineers calculated this 90-day lifetime based on what they thought the dust cover would cover the solar panels to the point that they wouldn't recharge their batteries anymore well I still remember one of the guys in my department works on the spirit and opportunity teams and he came in with one morning with this real puzzled look and I said John what's the matter and he said you know we monitor the rover for its activity last night the rovers energy level tripled and we have no idea why it did that so the engineers are very concerned that something broke and and some capacitor or whatever is out well it turns out a dust devil went over the rover and cleaned the solar panels that has been happening for the last 14 years at certain seasons they can just sort of count on it and that has what allowed both of those rovers to last as long as they did you can't plan them but they're common enough that they have scoured the solar panels off and allowed these solar powered vehicles to operate as long as they did so now a little bit of present um, information about what's going on and I'm gonna focus on my department just because since you guys are here in northern Virginia I want to, you to realize downtown at the Air and Space Museum we're doing some real fundamental Mars research in our little uh, small department Bruce Campbell is our department chair and he is one of the world experts on radar so this is one of the latest radars that is looking through the north polar cap of Mars and again there is layering but Lyle this isn't sedimentary rocks this is layering in the polar cap we are looking through about three kilometers worth of stuff and the climatologists would love to drill through this thing and get a climatic record preserved in the polar caps of Mars um, just hasn't reached the level of being a funded mission in NASA yet but that's still high priority Bruce is involved in doing the radar sounding that that will uh, eventually support if we are able to do one of those drilling missions John Grant another member in our department 
is involved in rover operations for Spirit, Opportunity, and now Curiosity. And so he does the mission planning there at the museum. I love getting to walk by his door when he isn't in a telecon, which is most of the time, um, and asking John what's going on on Mars today. And he'll tell me about it was Spirit and then Opportunity and now Curiosity and uh, what's happening. Now, John doesn't have a joystick and says, you know, we're going to make the rover turn left. What John does is oversees a group of about 50 scientists and engineers who argue for hours, what is the science goal for the next day on Mars, and how are we going to do that? And it takes a lot of give and take on both sides. The scientists want certain things done. The engineers say you can or can't do it. And that's what John sort of rides herd on these cats to get the mission plan decided. Then they write out that load sequence and it goes up the next day uh, to the rover. And he's been doing this for um, 14 years because he started with opportunity. Instead of three months. Instead of three months, exactly. So this has been a huge sort of personal challenge, but John still loves it. I mean, he gets frustrated at times when he this, the guys don't always agree, but um, it's phenomenal that we're still being able to uh, certainly curiosity we got another rover plan for 2020 that will undergo the same kind of sequence and it, it's just exciting that we might have roving capabilities on Mars for decades Tom Waters another one of our scientists in the department uses a different radar this is on a European spacecraft and it penetrates even deeper so this is the South Pole in this case of Mars you don't see as quite as many layers because it's a longer wavelength radar that doesn't show the detail as much, but it penetrates much deeper. And the combination of what Tom's work works with with Marsis and what Bruce works with with Sherrod, those two put together is giving us a real powerful synergy on understanding the subsurface oops on Mars. And I think I pushed, yep, bumped that button. Um, Bob Craddock studies hydrology on Mars, and he does must, much of this using those MOLA topographic maps and calculating how water would flow and then comparing it to what the orbiters actually show us the surface looks like. And then field work, he also studies sand dunes like I do. So all of us have some combination of doing terrestrial studies to better understand what we think is going on on Mars. Ross Irwin is our most recent uh, Martian addition to the department and he was one of the co-authors on the latest geologic map of the whole planet. Um, this is sort of the, the fundamental basis when either the orbiters or the rover teams talk about what rocks they're driving on. This is the geologic context for the planet. Here I am at Great Sand Dunes um, and I know you guys look for wonderful dark sky locations. The park is in fact uh, they have proposed to become part of the uh, Dark Sky International group because in, these, uh, in the times when the moon is not out and it's clear this is a very good Dark Sky location in the continental U.S. I know it's a bit far for you guys to travel, but if you're in Colorado, consider going here. Now, I study sand dunes. Well, this is, I won't even go into what that means. We aren't sure what this is. Again, this is about 500 meters across this could be a small sand dune or a very large ripple. And in fact, we're now leaning towards that second in interpretation. And is that a big deal? It actually is a big deal scientifically. Those two form very differently. And we now are collecting evidence that these very large things form much like the wind ripples you might see on the beach, except these can get to be several meters in height and up to hundreds of meters in length, one ripple. So just a summary of orbiters that are active right now. Um, Mars Odyssey has been there for over 10 years. Mars Reconnaissance, over 16 years. Re Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has been there for 10 years. This is the one, that's the Sherrod radar antenna that Bruce uses. Um, and this has, that, that is the high-rise camera that's taking all those wonderful uh, orbital pictures. Odyssey, the name for those science fiction fans out there, the naming was intentional. This got to Mars in 2001. And there were enough scientists and engineers who remembered Arthur C. Clarke's wonderful story that that's the name of the orbiting spacecraft. It is still, both of these are still 
relays for uh, the rovers. This is a European spacecraft and it goes out of the view, but this is the longer antenna that Tom's involved with on the European uh, radar sounder. So the, all three are still active. These are three more recent orbiters that are also active. NASA loves acronyms. I just spelled this one out. It is designed to study the atmosphere and is telling us how Mars has lost its at atmosphere at present, but with measurements that will allow us to calculate into the past how that atmospheric loss took place. This is a European orbiter, trace gas, very fine or, or small amounts. And one of their big goals is methane. And they are in fact detecting small ephemeral, they come and go pockets of methane around Mars. That's of great interest for biological implications. And this one I think is neat. The, this is the Indian Space Agency that they still have an active orbiter um, doing a variety of things, including uh, another methane detector that is complementary to what's going on with the Europeans. I think it's just really cool that India decided we're going to go to Mars, did it, their own rocket, they are running everything on their own, and without going into a lot of the cultural details, a lot of the engineers and the scientists are women. That is a huge deal in India to uh, make it aware, make the country aware that the women are really contributing to this cutting edge uh, activity. Back to the rovers. Now, we, I already mentioned that curiosity, I mean, uh, opportunity rather, had this dust storm problem. So here is a global map of the dust. In this case, on June 6th, it was still growing. The last time we heard from opportunity uh, was on June 11th. Unfortunately, it was just at the heart of the dustiest part of this particular global dust storm. This was the only selfie that Opportunity took. Its camera couldn't focus as good as the one on Curiosity, but finally the, the Opportunity guys said, hey, we're tired of Curiosity always getting all of the selfie opportunities. So on its 5,000th day on Mars, it took this mosaic showing uh, it uh, sitting on the surface of Mars and and I remember Steve Squires talking about this again and he said it was a bit nostalgic because they launched this in 2003 we hadn't seen our spacecraft for 16 or 17 years and now we finally see opportunity on Mars it's unclear if it has survived this massive uh, dust storm John told me just this week that they uh, JPL is in this whole sequence of efforts to listen for a signal but probably by the end of this year, if we have not heard a signal, that's when they're going to get serious about declaring that the mission uh, is over. Curiosity, as I mentioned, is nuclear powered. It did not have any issue in the dust. That's sort of down around where this green dot is. It was just at the edge. Um, the dust deposit could have been thicker and it wouldn't have affected it, uh, but it was just fortunately far enough south that it was not as severely impacted as uh, opportunity was. What? Maybe next time they can put a white part on it. Well, you know, a lot of people ask about, couldn't you put something on the spacecraft to sweep the dust off? Lots of problems with that, but I like an answer that Squires gave to at a science conference when someone asked this question. And he said, for me, people designing missions like this, mass is everything, the weight of what is on the spacecraft, and he was not willing to kick off one of his science instruments to try out something like what you're describing of a way of cleaning the solar panel. So in building spacecraft, particularly the ones that are operating on Mars, mass always wins, and if you can do it with less mass, you will gain much more favor from the engineers and the scientists both. Exactly. Um, this November, just a month from now, uh, InSight will get to Mars. It's not a rover. This hopefully looks a little bit similar to that drawing of Phoenix. Well, in fact, it's the same bus. It's just it has a seismometer and a drill to place a heat probe at the bottom of a two-meter drill core uh, into the surface. This is a geophysical mission. We're really anxious to see what this seismometer comes up with.
the Vikings had seismometers, only one of them unhooked. That was the thing was held in place during flight and the little pin didn't release itself on Viking 2. The Viking 1 seismometer did turn on, but it turned out to be a much better detector of the wind blowing on the spacecraft than of a seismic sig signal. So this is going to be our very first view into the interior, the deep interior of the planet. Two-year mission is the primary goal. Solar powered, so they are not expecting this one to last forever. But based on spirit and opportunity, we think that this will operate for at least uh, two Earth years, one Mars year. The seismometer is passive. There was a lot of discussion, could we do active, as in impact something. But we have known, thanks to high-rise, that enough objects are striking Mars today that the team is quite confident if it operates for two Earth years, we're going to get up to 20 impacts that it will be big enough that they should provide an active signal. Um, but it's going to be looking for Mars quakes. That's, that's its main goal. complex question. She said, is the core of Mars frozen? We do in fact believe that is the case now, but is the planet dead? Most definitely not. The high-rise images have shown us that it's much more active than we gave it credit for. Is it tectonically active? That's what breaks rocks and causes things to move around. We don't know. That's what this instrument will tell us how seismically active at least this part uh, of the planet is. So hopefully Early next year, there will be an answer to your question as to just how seismically active Mars might be. Um, there are definitely going to be landslides, and those are big enough that they could trigger, trigger seismic events. So those are expected. Impacts are expected. What is not known is major sort of plate shifts in part because we don't think Mars has plates. If this thing detects, exactly, there's no geologic evidence for plate boundaries like we're used to uh, here on the Earth. So it'd be a huge surprise if this detected thousands of Mars quakes. This, the team is hoping for dozens, and that will give them enough to, to tell us a whole lot more about the interior than we know now. In 2020, the next rover will go. Uh, this looks a lot like Curiosity because, again, it's the same bus, same arm, but a completely different suite of instruments on the robot arm and in the body of the spacecraft. This will be looking for chemistry, but the chemical signature of past life. This is the first time where that is the science goal of the mission, to drill, collect material, and look for the chemical signature left by past uh, life if it was present. And now we'll end up with sort of the future, well we were getting into the future with robotics, but with human exploration. And this is happening in a place in far northern Canada where they're testing out uh, spacesuits um, to get ready for humans to go to Mars. Well this is one my new favorite Martian movie is The Martian, but as a scientist they've got several things wrong that I'll talk about just a couple but on the engineering side they got a lot right because Andy Weir the guy who wrote the book that the movie is based on is a JPL engineer so he knew what he was talking about with the engineering now Mark Watney and all of this amazing story it's unclear how if ever we would you know go through that scenario what I want to point out is his spacesuit. This looks a heck of a lot different than this one. This is more like what the astronauts have used on the moon. And in fact, at least in my talking to engineers, that's more likely than this very light thing that they used in the Martian movie. It's unclear to me that that would have been enough uh, support. Why? Because at the current atmospheric pressure on Mars, it's equivalent to being 100,000 feet up in our atmosphere that doesn't leave a whole lot of pressure left. That's why I think the spacesuits were underdone in the Martian movie. Um, another thing that really bugged me because I study the wind, the whole premise of what left Mark stranded up there, these are rocks flying against the astronauts, uh-uh. Just doesn't happen at all. 
We're lucky if sand grains get set into motion, let alone rocks that fly and the wind is strong enough to almost blow the spacecraft over. That was way overdoing it, and even Weir uh, agrees with that. But the engineering is great, that uh, this is a very good representation of what we might eventually use uh, on Mars. The wheels actually look somewhat like the Spirit and Opportunity wheels, just scaled up. That's real. And the habitats and things like that, these are based on designs that NASA is currently testing. So that part is excellent uh, in the movie. The agriculture is possible, but something that was completely ignored by the movie that you just should be aware of is that the Martian soil is very non-healthy for uh, terrestrial organisms. Some multiple spacecraft have sound, found something called a perchlorite. That is a compound that just really is not good for biology. And Mark didn't deal with that. We don't know how to separate that out from the Martian soil. So that was one of the main differences. Uh, Watney would have had a challenge to grow his potatoes without somehow removing a major component of the soil that we've seen everywhere. So to sort of store that away. Although we want to have greenhouses. That is part of the long-term plan. This, I hope, is not. Mars One was one of these one-way missions, and there's still some talk about it, but that's not the way to explore Mars, to send people up there and leave them. I don't think that's the right approach. That is not at all what NASA is talking about. What we do want to eventually see are families, and Pat Rawlings is a space artist, so these are his three boys in little astronaut suits building a snowman near the uh, polar caps on Mars. I think it's great. And last picture here is um, astronauts coming to Viking 2, but Pat specifically had them backlit. And so we don't know what the flag is and we don't know what the astronauts look like. That, he, he, he made this painting about 15 years ago. Um, I think the odds are 50-50 that the next boot prints not only on Mars but maybe on the moon are going to be Chinese rather than American. It is unclear at all what country is going to finally get to Mars. I personally think it's going to be a planetary thing, not any one nation, but we have to do it as a planet and decide that it's that important. And different from the talk, but just as a, an announcement that we're going to have a brand new Exploring the Planets gallery scheduled to open in fall of 2021. I'm the lead curator for the gallery. I'm terribly excited about it. I'll be glad to try and answer questions for you, but uh, I also know we don't have a lot of time before the next speaker, speaker comes here, but let's try and answer what we can. Good question. Where do we get our power from? And for Mars, the, the question is still both, that there are plans to use electricity for, for different types of Mars missions. Beyond Mars, it gets real tough with solar panels, although the current Juno mission has done it. It's just they have flown solar panels that are the size of football fields to be able to get enough solar power at Jupiter to run a mission. Ah. So that has expanded our range at which we know solar is viable. Beyond Jupiter, it's very definitely nuclear powered, and we've just got to figure out how to get past the regulations that make people scared to do this. It really isn't that dangerous. I've heard the engineers talking about launch failures, and they have to design all of these little nuclear pellets that run these things in such a way that even if the rocket completely blew up, those things would not be disrupted. They are in such hardened locations that that should not be what keeps us from launching spacecraft. So I hope nuclear stays an option because in the outer solar system, that's the only way to go, really. Any other final question? Current plans of basically an airplane on Mars. If you didn't hear all the question, are we going to have airplanes on Mars? And I, I do believe eventually we will. 
I was actually involved on one of the mission proposals for a small airplane, and it was not funded because it was such a short mission. It would last a couple hours, and you don't want to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on two hours of video as cool as it would be. So I think practically when we have people there, that's when we're really going to take advantage of the air option. Even though it's very thin atmosphere, there is enough that you can use airfoils. Um, drones are a real possibility, e again, even in that very thin atmosphere. So I, I just suspect it's going to be harder to convince NASA to fly them robotically. That'll probably have to wait until people are there to tend them. That's true. If you didn't hear them, those don't have to land to collect useful data, and you could actually survey large areas. So that's a viable science point of view. It's just so far that has not won in the uh, proposal. Pan um, you just have to get something that's fragile uh, and big over there, uh, and, and that's, that's, a hard, that's a hard sell. Yep. Um, I will be glad to answer more questions while the next speaker comes up. And... I know someone has meteorites here. Well, I brought a special one if you want to come up and look at it. This is a piece of Mars that landed on Earth as a meteorite. And how did I get it? This is, did not come from the Smithsonian collections. My wife bought it for me on eBay. <laughs> you can buy pieces of other planets, just deal with reputable meteorite sellers. And uh, believe me, after we got this, I had the advantage of going to natural history, went to my meteorite friends, said, we just bought this. This is what they said it was. He got out his microscopes and books. And 10 minutes later, he said, yep, you got what they said you were supposed to get. So deal with people that have good eBay ratings, however that works. <laughs> I'm not the eBay person in the family. You probably figured out. But you can own pieces of other planets now. Um, I think that's really cool. Did you stand on it and pretend to be <laughs> <laughs> did did I stand on it? No, I didn't. But I keep it in a little plastic case. I did touch it so that I have touched a piece of Mars. I'm not going to get there, but I've at least touched a rock that came from Mars. So 